Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Superficial Spirit. I should get somebody to write me a jingle for my podcast. Remember when jingles, I was just reading um, about how jingles used to be a huge business in marketing. And um, now they have computers doing it. So good news for all the mu musicians out there. Um, hope you're doing well. I am um, in my new place and I'm just sort of figuring out the setup. My ring light was in storage and I missed her, but she's back now. So I'm looking all good. Um, just a reminder, you can watch the episodes on YouTube. I've started posting them there and um, yeah. I, I, lo I love YouTube. That's a, I, I really originally thought that that's where I would do my um, show eventually. I always envisioned YouTube, but then the podcast thing happened. It's so much easier. I, I feel a little bit intimidated by YouTube just because there are so many amazing YouTubers who make it look so easy and it's not easy to look that expensive. Oh my God. And to make all the thumbnails and stuff, um, there's a lot of work that goes into it. So I'm slowly adapting to all of the different platforms that podcasts are on. So if you have any tips, let me know. Thanks so much for tuning in up until now. We're like almost six months in to the podcast. No, that's not what I mean. Is it? Yes, we are. Because 52 weeks in a year. And I think this is, you know, we're in episodes mid twenties. So I, I, I'm really happy with how things are progressing. And I really appreciate everybody who listens and I'm having great conversations. And um, I don't know when I'll be posting this episode, but today is the election in America. And we're doing, um, I, I just actually recorded a video for Instagram too, just talking about how, man, I've been really affected by the, polarization of the media and social media and just the tension out there in the world and it's getting to be winter and the pandemic you can't do anything we just moved my neighbors were having parties every weekend they're quiet now thank god we talked to them um but there's definitely like this depression that's just kind of like always looming and i'm working really hard to counter that with um, you know, my meditation and trying to eat healthy and working out at home because the gyms are closed, I'm trying to stay focused on work and grateful that I have a job. But, you know, it does get to you. The world is fucked up right now. And um, I've been seeing a lot of people on my social media that I am so surprised at how their um, messaging and their belief systems are evolving to what I guess maybe it was my own night like I was naive to who they were because there's a lot of anti-maskers there there's a lot of people really critical of the government and of the pandemic um and first of all I don't think it's bad to question your government at all I don't think it's bad to question anything I think we should constantly be in a state of questioning um but we have to be able to do it in a way that doesn't alienate people you know like everybody has their claws sunk into the things that they believe and it's so 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 intense right now and it's making me question my own beliefs um not about the virus not about the pandemic um not necessarily about our society but i mean me personally like what are the things i believe and why do i cling to them um and how does it affect me um in what ways do my beliefs serve me in what ways do they not serve me um you know my whole whole life when i was a kid as a teenager and into my 20s was based around the belief that my dreams would come true. I had a special calling. Um, pop culture and nightlife were spiritual conduits for me. They opened me up and sort of made my beliefs even more robust because they were so validating. And now, you know, I have so much space from the clubs. Oh my God, I can't remember the last time I was at a club. Like I did go, not last Halloween. Oh no, last Halloween, I went to a club for like an hour. I was home by. Not really my thing, completely different experience when you're not drinking. Um, but now that I have some distance, I'm able to sort of look at that time in my life with new eyes and a fresh perspective. And um, I'm working on, I don't know if it's a book or like a zine, but I've been writing, I, I've been writing based on the podcast and it's basically an exploration of the things that i believe and why what at what point in my life did i start believing that my dreams could come true that i was destined to be a star and how did that what were the steps like where did that start and what was the path they took and how did it get me here because i i'm a scorpio i was born in the week of depth and so i have this there's there, I do have a nature where I, I do want to get deep. I want to find out why I am the way I am. 
and why I do the things I do. And um, it's been interesting. I mean, Evan and I talked about this on the podcast before. Not everybody's dreams can come true. Not everybody can be a star. But that actually directly conflicts with, with, a, with a lot of people believe that you can manifest your own reality, that whatever you want is true, um, or that whatever you want can happen. Um, you know, in a more wholesome way, if you work hard, you'll get what you want. Um, if you believe it bad enough, it will come true. All of those things, which I have believed so fervently. Um, and I wouldn't say that I don't believe them now, but I am open to having discussions about like, you know, what's interesting me, interesting to me, not necessarily the people whose dreams come true because we are bombarded by those images all the time. The people who are rich and famous who are telling us how, how, you know, they worked hard and oh my God, I was watching Kim Kardashian on, um, not David Letterman. It was the E! True Hollywood story of Kim Kardashian, how they were really, trying to paint this picture of how she's overcome so much adversity and she's such a hardworking woman and she's a pioneer. And it's like, listen, yes, Kim Kardashian, sure. She stands alone in pop culture. I mean, if you want to completely forget about Paris Hilton. Um, but, you know, the overcoming adversity thing and how she's worked hard. I'm like, no, you were literally grew up with rich and famous people. Your family had a reality show on E! You were best friends with Paris Hilton and you started selling products to your social media following. She had a sex tape. It was traumatizing to her. That is adversity. Her dad died. Totally. You had to overcome that. She was robbed in Paris. Those are all really crazy things to happen to a human. And I don't doubt that they had a big impact on her. I also wish that at some point in these interviews, people were like, so how do you feel about your family being almost billionaires and having, you know, only five people work at your internet companies? And like, how many people work at Kylie Cosmetics? You know, um, never in the interview did they acknowledge the privilege. I mean, she does in some ways, like they say, uh, like she will acknowledge, you know, I knew I grew up with privilege. Um, we were really lucky. And then the whole conversation is about how hard she works and how um, she's a pioneer. And I don't know, it's a harder, harder sell for me. I, I definitely didn't finish those shows feeling like, wow, we're so lucky to have Kim Kardashian. Mind you, when I watched the Paris Hilton documentary, I definitely did feel that way. I was like, wow, Paris is fucking amazing. So maybe it's just my personal beliefs, uh, my personal connection to the celebrities. But yeah, I'm, I've definitely been in this more critical mind frame of my spiritual beliefs, where they come from, and what actually is spirituality. I mean, if it is relative, if spirituality can be anything, then what does that mean? If I can have a spiritual experience going to the club doing coke and partying with drag queens, and so can somebody who goes to Rome to see the Pope, and they're such different experiences. Um, what does that mean for spirituality as a whole? And at what point do our beliefs stop serving us and end up being toxic? Um, you know, when do we start closing ourselves off to reality in exchange for, you know, blindly following the things we believe? I don't know. There has to be a relationship with both, right? You have to be able to have beliefs. I think that's important, but you also be able, have to be able to um, be critical of yourself and the things around you so that you stay on planet Earth. Hey. Okay. My guest today, holy shit. I'm so excited. I discovered their podcast last week. It's called Conspirituality Podcast, and it's a really great concept, basically exploring how the right-wing media and the spiritual communities, wellness, yoga, all those are actually starting to overlap. Um, my guest um, is somebody who helps cult survivors. He's an expert in cults. Like, hello, the how am I so lucky to be talking to somebody who knows all about cults, um, the cult of celebrity? I can't wait to talk to him about um, my personal journey, you know, the belief that we can all come true. And then all of the spiritual books that I've read that so many millions of people have read and believed, like A Course in Miracles, like anything by Abraham Hicks, anybody, um, Gabby Bernstein, all of these huge powerhouses in the self-help community that have been um, dominated the that um, community for so long with the messages. Um, yeah, I want to get behind it all. I want to have a critical discussion. So I'm really excited to have him here. His name is Matthew Remsky. I'm going to let him into the room right now. Hello. Hello, Peter. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking to me this morning. Sure. Do you, um, do I need headphones or do I sound okay to you? You sound great. 
Okay, great. Yeah, you sound perfectly fine. Um, I so I was just recording the intro and saying how I was so excited to find your podcast last week. I've I've it's the first time I've heard of this spiritual conversation with a more critical lens and the way that you're pinpointing so many things that I've been attached to for so long. It's right. such a great, 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 great approach to the conversation. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. Oh, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thanks so much for your kind words. No problem. Um, so for those who don't know you or the podcast, do you want to give me a little spiel about um, sort of the podcast, a little bit about you and why you decided to go public with the ideas that you have in this way? Well, um, I've known my colleagues, uh, Derek and Julian, for about 10 years. Um, I've never met Derek in person, but Julian I met once uh, when I was in L.A., uh, but we've been cultural critics, really, in the yoga space for most of that time. And we share some similarities. Uh, there are some differences of opinion that we have. But, you know, two of us are, are cult survivors uh, from uh, our, our yoga days. Uh, well, not yoga for me, but uh, within new spirituality contexts. Uh, and uh, we have always been advocates for you know, critical thinking and the examination of the intersection between capitalism and wellness and what that means and what it does. Uh, so that's been consistent. I think that um, when lockdown crushed into our lives, um, that it became very clear that we were going to reach a kind of crisis or escalation point for uh, some of the more virulent strains of magical thinking and charismatic overreach within wellness spaces. And it was Derek, I think, who found the essay uh, called The Emergence of Conspirituality, written by Charlotte Ward and David Voas, uh, published in 2011. And the term itself and just their abstract for it uh, that, you know, they were noting this convergence, a horseshoe effect by which uh, male-oriented, paranoid, uh, political, and cynical thinking was meeting uh, feminine-oriented, new age, and transformational or utopian thinking uh, within wellness spaces. That was very resonant for us. So, um, we jumped on it. And, and uh, yeah, uh, feedback has been has been good so far. And uh, I think that also we have figured out that, well, not definitely not figured out, but we've seen that conspirituality is a broader landscape uh, through which the uh, emergence of QAnon becomes more plausible uh, also, and also more um, understandable from an analytical perspective. But uh, it's almost as if, um, you know, conspirituality is the is the landscape, and QAnon is the sort of mandala in the center of it. So yeah. we're, looking, we're looking at that really closely too. And I know that you're in Toronto. Uh, we're also studying how it uh, it it goes global, and it becomes transcultural, and it becomes indigenous or or nationalized to 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 other places. And we're speaking on election day, right, in the U.S. Uh, yeah. So. So, um, you know, the, the, the broader picture, you know, long after whatever happens to Trump happens, uh, I think conspirituality and QAnon are going to be with us for a long time. I do too. And I think, you know, for me, discovering your podcast and this whole conversation was, it, it was almost like I was watching a movie. Like I, I grew up with a very firm belief that, you know, I, if I work hard, my dreams will come true. There's something special about me. Um, I, I had this magical idea about what the world was like. And as I got older and discovered um, like self-help and spirituality, this message was validated to me through the law of attraction, A Course in Miracles. And I really found that that community made me feel like all the things I believed growing up were true, that my dreams could come true, that if I really believed I was a star, I would become a star. Um, right. And I feel like those beliefs served me for so long. And then, you know, I'm 35 now. The longer you're alive, the more you're like, oh, wait, maybe everything I thought about the way my life is going to be isn't actually going to happen. And when you see evidence 
that your beliefs maybe aren't true, it puts you in this interesting mind frame where in my body, I do feel like the law of attraction, there is something there. I do feel like I have a sense of purpose and that there is a God and I'm, I'm called to do certain things. But also all of these people who are telling you, you know, think rich, be rich, the law of attraction, they're making money by selling these books. And that's always been, and you go to these psychic fairs and you have all of these people trying to make money. They're all broke. They're all looking for love. And I felt like there was this gap where, yes, it resonates with me, but also why isn't everybody rich and famous then? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Well, because the dream of neoliberalism is that uh, everybody should be whilst the economy is always trickle up. And I think um, one of the things that has become apparent to me over, you know, about 25 years in, in um, new spirituality, new religious movement circles, and also in, in cults is that um, a lot of the ideologies that you've just named, you know, from law of attraction to its, I would say, scriptural basis in, um, in uh, A Course in Miracles, um, really uh, emphasize a kind of uh, neoliberal propaganda um, of the empowerment of the individual and the erasure of structural oppression or just material limitations um it's a it's a it's a it's a mindset and it's a spirituality that pretends that history is over uh that mm. people people don't have to uh struggle and work and uh find um you know material shelter and well-being and that that's always difficult in all ages and it's always going to be plagued by injustice um you know, I think you're. I think you're of like a really interesting age. I'm 48, and I think I think to to be your age is to almost not have um, the benefit of like a a pre postmodern understanding of the world in which um, you know class is real, race is real. Um, you know, structural inequality is a real thing. And I'm not saying you don't have these things now, but I'm, yeah, saying, I, that, I'm yeah. saying that the, I'm saying that the, the, the general political culture of, you know, post eighties, uh, uh, you know, liberal democracy uh, through the, throughout the world has functioned specifically to erase those differences in the same way that A Course in Miracles wants to tell you that, you know, every, every, you know, you, you are, you, you within yourself, regardless of all, any circumstance, uh, have complete and utter divine power, right? Yeah. So there's a, there's a way in which the, the spiritualities that we talk about have served as a kind of propaganda arm, um, an emotional propaganda arm for uh, our basic political economies. And, and they don't, it, that's, I don't want to say that that's their intention or that that is, um, you know, somebody planned that all out. It's just that I think that religion and spirituality is created by culture and there's a dialogue between them. There has to be some sort of, some sort of resonance, uh, you know, A Course in Miracles and the law of attraction serve a particular time, as does something like yoga, where, you know, I'll just give a brief example. Uh, you know, what is the, what I, I bring this up in other places too, but, but what, is the, what is the origin of the modern urban yoga space? Um, it, it generally exists, like your studio exists because of gentrification. Yeah. Um, in the 1950s and the 1960s, there was no such thing as like a 3,000 square foot warehouse space with hardwood <laughs> floors where you could go and fucking do stretching. Like that just didn't yeah. exist. And so why does it exist? It exists because what used to be in that space was a manufacturing outfit uh, that then in the 80s got uh, globalized and, and uh, the labor got offshored to Bangladesh or to Vietnam. And then suddenly there's this space where somebody can rent it fairly cheaply, uh, and then do this weird new activity that doesn't actually produce anything for the economy except the aspirational self. And so it's like, 
why yoga and then and then the whole sort of embodied aspect of yoga is about flexibility and receptivity and being able to adapt to change and rolling with things and boy you know just being in the flow of everything and isn't that exactly what the political economy wants you to do yeah. which to find you know which is to be self responsible for maintaining your own regulation whilst the world is actually chaotic and you're not being given any promises whatsoever by your culture it's a little bit better here in canada than it is in the united states because we do have universal health care but i yeah. mean if if given the choice uh you know the 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 you know the conservative end of this country would 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 eat that away because they too buy into this ideology that well really the individual is the central component of the society and and we should encourage individuals to be successful and if they can't be successful then fuck them i mean yeah then fuck them that's the whole thing because these it, it, you know, when you bring up my age it's interesting because i also grew up in a time where you know it was like the reality stars and social media started to emerge and it was the commodification of self so you add the you know the the spiritual the way that they're um commercializing spirituality now mixed with the way that we consume pop culture and celebrity kind of meshed for me in a way yeah. where i feel like I'm being told on a spiritual level that I just have to connect and align with the right vibration and I can create any reality. And I'm watching people with no talent become rich and famous. And I'm like, okay, so all I need to do is meditate, you right. know, be clear, and then I will become super famous. And when you go into like, for example, nightlife and you're drinking, you're doing drugs, it's all validating because it's kind of like this illusion. And then it was really hard for me on a personal level to start breaking down those belief systems and be like, like, no, like, like I said, when we first started talking, what is the balance between this resonates with me? And also I've been, somebody has been lying to me my whole life, right. you know, like right. it's, it's, well, it's a well, hard it's balance. Like, right. Well, I mean, it's, it's, there can always be too much of a good thing. I mean, the basic, I, I, it makes me think of like cognitive behavioral therapy or something like that. The basic, sort of premise that uh, you can, within reason, make certain organizational and behavioral choices with your day that will help you regulate your mood. Uh, and that will be helpful. And, you know, you might have strategies like making lists or, you know, having a timer or making sure that you're you know, your social media consumption is limited to a certain amount of time per day or, you know, whatever it is, you, you, can, you, you can set goals, you can give yourself limits, you can uh, do a certain amount of, of self-regulation. Tony Robbins will say, tell you that that's the only thing that you have to do. And in right. fact, in fact, you know, that, that if you complain about something else being an influential factor in your life, like race or like, you know, being gay or being, you know, being marginalized yeah. in some way. If you, if you complain about that, you haven't sufficiently taken responsibility for making your lists and setting your timers and whatever. <laughs> uh, right. So, so yeah. it's like, it's like that, it, that, that is, there's some line where, I mean, Tony Robbins just leaps over it with his, yeah. you know, with his 25 foot legs, but like <laughs> it's uh, it, it, at a certain point, everybody on a charismatic uh, kind of conveyor belt will cross over that line where this one fairly good idea that they have just becomes the thing that they're going to turn into the magic pill that solves everything and the world is just more complex than that and 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 when when influencers you know robins would be like the absurd end of the the spectrum but everybody within that category uh who who is an influencer generally has one bit of content to offer and then they have like a delivery device that we can call charisma which isn't based upon accreditation or um you know or or training or peer reviewed research or anything like that it's like a glow right yeah it's exactly yes. oh it's God. something that makes them attractive it's something that that plays well on social media which then amplifies this kind of marketability of an ineffable quality called charisma that encourages a person 
through positive feedback to then like expand their 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 claims about this one little useful piece of information that they have <laughs> until until it's until it's like the only thing that can possibly save the world and here's my new training seminar in my one yeah. little thing that can save the world and so it's it's um there's so many sort of disruptive influences that that come together with the marketing of you know helpful ideas that can cross over the line into sort of tyrannical ideas do you think then that like what is the value of somebody who is charismatic and maybe does have insight into living a better life and they do feel like i want to help people is there value in somebody getting online just randomly and saying hey guys this is what i want to do and then that's enough or does the problem lie in the way that it grows and then it starts feeding the ego and it turns into this way to make money like do you think that it starts um genuine and authentic and they really just do feel like they oh they have often. A message that can have. yeah oh often 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 i'm sure it does i'm sure it does and i don't think and i think that i think that the explosion of social media has happened so quickly that there have been no user manuals uh, written uh, for it. It's not like, I mean, I would, I have, I have two sons, they're, they're eight and four. And I would love, I mean, we'll do this at home if they don't get it in public school anyway, but I would love some sort of introductory primer to like how social media works based upon engagement and, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, what, what it's, what the, what the impacts are. And I mean, they can just watch social dilemma too. So it doesn't, it does, yeah. that kind of work is okay, done. Yeah. But I mean, um, it, your question actually does make me think of the eight-year-old who is like filled with creativity and bursting at the seams with everything that he wants to do. And like he, and, and you know, it is a breathless task to keep up with encouraging all of that and providing, you know, avenues for expression and, and so on. And like, um, but... <laughs> It, it, your question reminds me of, or makes me think of like, what would happen if I just released all of that excitement or if he was able to just release all of that excitement onto YouTube with no oh my God. sense of, with no sense of like, well, how does the world work? How is valuable knowledge actually produced? How are things verified? Um, all of the, it's, it's like the childlike, enthusiasm would itself be the product that the person would have to continually upsell and recycle and 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 amplify but i mean if you took that and you said okay now like learning you know an instrument or learning right. you know, how to be a really good writer okay now go to school now, like it, what, how, what, in whatever form that takes, like get some mentorship, recognize what it means to do something within a community of, of thinkers that can hold you accountable for, you know, your overreach or your over enthusiasm or your bullshit or your tendency to like, you know, push the, the facts a little bit. I mean, this is especially true for writing, you know, because there, there's a lot of people who just are bursting at the seams to share things with writing. Uh, and, you know, it would be great if that energy could be taken uh, and really given some care and some, and some mentorship and the kind of mentorship that says, that says, okay, if you're going to want to, if you're going to contribute something useful to a lot of people, that's not going to be a solo effort. It's going to be an mm. effort that actually goes through, you know, a review process and it's going to have to accept feedback back and you're going to have to discuss it and you're going to have to like stand by what you say uh you know in in a way that that you know the social media climate just doesn't doesn't really force people to do yeah no it's a good point because right now you can have an idea you can be really excited and share it and that energy is contagious and people get addicted to that rush of like oh my god this is new this is exciting and right, right instead of taking that and being like, what does this mean? How do I channel this? And it being attached to some kind of structure, it can take on a life of its own and, and I guess get away from, like human beings are not responsible enough for social media. Like you said, we have not <laughs> learned how to properly share information and ideas because you can get a little idea. You can be watching the news, get triggered, 
and put something online and then cultivate this huge new community of hate or bigotry or whatever without even having that intention. And I think without the structure, right, it gets away with us. So. And it's not just young people. It's not just young people too. Like I I want to point out, uh, you know, being a fellow Torontonian that our neighbor, Jordan Peterson has done exactly that from like a young Mm -hmm. boomer perspective. Right. Right. Which is, which is, you know, here's, here's a person with intense charisma, uh, uh, a real tendency towards overreach and going out of his lane with regard to the actual research psychology that he was trained in, who thinks that he's able to, you know, go to Ottawa and give testimony before the Senate on B- Bill C-16 and get it totally wrong, get called out on being wrong, kind of ignore that because he's not actually responsible as a U of T professor for getting things right in the public sphere. And so then he starts making money on Patreon, being a darling of the alt-right. So I don't think that he has, I don't think he has, you know, uh, uh, negative intentions. I think he's very, he's just, he's very, very confused about what's helpful and what isn't. And then that's overlaid with a lot of blind spots with regard to you know how uh, w- what the impacts of his exclusionary and evangelical politics actually are so it's not just I'm not just thinking about kids I'm also thinking yeah. about like how social media itself is almost infantilizing that way and people who are like legit professors can just be completely like snow jobbed into thinking that they're more interesting than they are Totally. And it's intoxicating to get that kind of validation and the rush of like a a fan base. Um, And I'm wondering, like, if there are so many people who so easily give into this type of personality, that charisma, is it really ever going to go away when we have the internet and social media now, when people are so readily attaching themselves to ideas and concepts that might not be based in reality? Because... I, I hear what you're saying. I also know a lot of people personally who don't really care about the facts. They don't care. They just want to feel good, you know? Right. And so right. I wonder, uh, my boyfriend and I talk about this all the time. Like, how do you get back to responsible consumption of media, of social media? And has it gone too far? Like the social dilemma, they say, oh, we have all, we're putting all these things in place to um, make it safer for people to consume. But I'm watching it. I'm like, do you really? It's like a raging forest fire. And they're like, we have a cup of water and we're really confident that if we put on the cup of water, it'll dim. But I mean, we're looking at an entire mountain that's on fire. And these people are like, no, no, no. We, we, we think we have a grapple on it. Do you really? Do you, you know, really? It's, it's, yeah, it's also, I mean, another thing just to do, go into the, our film review segment here is that like uh, the, the <laughs> there's also this premise in the whole narration of that documentary that um, the kind of um, mystified tears of of rich men is going to make it better, <laughs> right? Like, like oh, well, totally. you know, we really didn't we feel know. bad. We, were, we really, we really, we really feel bad, and so. To, but even that is an emphasize upon sort of like the the cult of individuality. It's like if you can get the guy who used to work for Facebook to, you know, to his his eyes to well up on camera in his multi-million dollar home while he's talking about the fact that he won't let his kids use social media. If you can get yeah. him to sort of have the sniffles, then like it has this the, the, I think we're at being asked to invest in the emotional value of that penitence when I just, I don't know what else they can do really having let the cat out of the bag, but I just have this feeling that, that um, analysis is not going to do it. Um, yeah. and, and so I don't have any, I don't have any answer for that except for, the prophylaxis of education. And, and I take this from my experience as a cult survivor and researcher is that, um, you know, there, there really is no defense against being recruited into a cult because the recruitment process is deceptive and, and it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how cagey you are. Um, you know, some people will feel the red flags, but a lot of people won't. Uh, once you're recruited into a toxic or abusive institution, it's very difficult to see that happen and to start drawing out and pulling away from it. And so, you know, cult researchers for the last 20 years have said, you know, basically 
what we need is inoculation against cultic dynamics. We need to be able to communicate at the high school level, like mm. what what is what what does a what does a negative what does a negative um, uh, uh, group dynamic feel like at the outset? What does charismatic abusive leadership look like and feel like? Um, so so that's I only have like long term answers, and I also have you know the the long term answer of when people are recovering from cultic environments, uh, they need uh, in-person personal care and relational restoration. But that happens on a scale that's totally different from the scale of social media virality and penetration, right? Which is like, so it's, it's almost like we've got this, you're right, you know, the, the mountain, mountain's on fire and we have cups of water. Uh, and I think don't think there's an answer for that, except yeah. almost, I would say, a spiritual answer, which is you, you have a cup of water and you just have to use it. And you, it might burn in your hands, but you just have to, it's the right thing to do to use it. We were talking to Stephen Hassan on our podcast about like, you know, well, what do you do with the person who, you know, got swept up into QAnon? How do you how do you how do you help yeah. them? He described yeah. this long he described this long, <laughs> tender, intimate process involving like baked goods that um, that that was going to be essential for giving the person a sense of reality based care. Uh, and I said to him, I said like, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who have been infected by this brain worm and their families are being destroyed by it. Like, how do we do this one person by one person? And how do you do this without being demoralized? And he mm. said, well, I, you know, I just, I just know that if I didn't do it, I would feel awful. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and it really does make a difference to help one person at a time. And, so, so occasionally I can be inspired by that, but, but yeah, yeah. otherwise I don't really have an answer. So looking at society right now today, would you say there are several major cults that people are a part of unknowingly, like through the media and through social media? You know, um, I, I think that like, I can speak to my sector, which is, which is yoga and wellness. And, um, and I would say that the ideology of neoliberalism is like the ocean in which these things swim. And the basic premises are, you're on your own, you must be self-responsible. Uh, here's a Lululemon manifesto for you to read like a prayer every day uh, that will you know, make you realize that all you have to do is drink eight glasses of water and you know, uh, have good intentions and stuff like that. Uh, and all your problems will go away. That kind of overall erasure of the notion of the common good, of the fact that we're actually interdependent and, and we're, 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 we're nothing if we don't care for each other, that's like lays of almost grooming groundwork for um, the, the, the principles of wellness and yoga to function as industries, right? Where, right. Uh, the 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 same ideas are at play. The same drives are at play. Like, you know, seize control of your life, make yourself, you know, find your internal divinity, uh, recognize that all of the answers are inside you. Uh, don't look outside of you. And so there's a kind of like narrowing of and a sharpening of the basic political economy and its ideology into uh, yoga and wellness. And then that sharpens even further into the tip of the, sp the spear where we get uh, particular yoga and wellness groups that are headed by charismatic leaders who are right. not only saying these things in general terms, but they're saying my technique for getting you to see your inner God or goddess uh, and relying on yourself and yourself alone is the only thing that you need. And there's a paradox there because that, that whole sort of, when you tell a person that when you tell a person that the answer lies within them and they go, Oh, okay, that sounds good. Well, what the fuck does that mean? Then, then they end up automatically having to depend on that, on that person, on that outside source 
for that action or that transformation to be defined. Mm. So there's an essential like lie there, which is, which is, you know, the answer is inside you. Oh, well, let me, let me tell you what that answer is, but let me tell you <laughs> what that answer is. And by the way, pay for my subscription thing. And exactly. So, so it's like, it's, so I'm not sure if I'm, I, I, what I, I guess I'm sort of dodging your, your question about are there mm. specific groups that we belong to, to say that it's like, there are there are there are broad social economic political forces at play that allow and enable cultic organizations to grow and emerge and be, and solidify and become highly organized. Um, if we had and and this is this is part of my you know this article that I'm writing for uh, the Walrus that that might be out in the next couple of weeks, uh, which is about how QAnon is infiltrating Canada. Uh, and how that's happening differently here than in the U.S. And part of what I'm suggesting, which is not something that I can prove, but I can, you know, provide some evidence for, is that it's not likely that QAnon will have as strong a political impact, uh, a material impact on, you know, the Canadian body politic as it has in the U.S. Like now, in the U.S. today, on election day, there's like 90 congressional can candidates that have professed some sort of allegiance to, wow. to, Holy to shit. QAnon. And here in Canada, uh, we have Maxime Bernier, who mm -hmm. tweeted out who tweeted out one Q-related tweet and then deleted it and said, "Actually, I didn't know what I was doing. Sorry about that." <laughs> Uh, and then there was one uh, conservative MP who did the same thing. She retracted it the same day. The one dude who is willing to do anything, uh, you know, known politician who's willing to do anything uh, that is remotely Q positive and stand by it is a guy named Peter Downing, uh, who was one of the founders of Wexit. And you know, now he's got this uh, America, USA, Alberta, you know, political oh, action God. committee or something like that. Like he's, he's a separatist. He's an Albertan separ separatist. Yeah. And, but he doesn't really have any political power. And so, and so there's nothing that has, so if we ask why hasn't QAnon mainstreamed into the political consciousness in Canada in the same way as it has in the US, I think part of the reason is not just because of parliamentary politics. It's not just because a lot of the QAnon narrative has to do with boosting Trump. It also has to do with the fact that we have something of a social safety net that gives common good meanings to people. Uh, we have some sense that, oh, if there's going to be a lockdown in a pandemic, during a pandemic, that the federal government is going to do something like CERB uh, to help people out. And that is going to be something that's trustworthy and it's not gonna be perfect. And there's gonna be people who are left out of it, but something in the country knows that something has to be done on a collective basis. And in the States, that's completely untrue. Uh, so, wow. so, so, and, and the result is like perpetual horizontal violence of, you know, marginalized people against marginalized people. Uh, and, and, uh, and then of course, you know, uh, white supremacy and all the rest. So, um, yeah, like, I don't think that, that QAnon will attain the same kind of, uh, hold material hold in this country but that's only based upon the strength of our social institutions. Uh, and so, yeah, like the okay. less, the less overt, you know, hyper-capitalism and neoliberalism, uh, the, the, the less possibility there is for the charismatic leader to come in uh, and to say, well, nobody's in control here. So I'm going to give you the, the one and only answer. Yeah. One thing that I keep hearing is people saying, follow your intuition. Does the news feel right to you. And this isn't oh, necessarily wow, yeah. guru, gurus. It's just sort of like a talking point of, well, I'm watching the news and it doesn't feel right. So therefore it might not be right. Now, what I'm wondering is human beings do have intuition. We do have an internal sense of like when something is right and wrong. So how, what's the relationship then between, wait, this doesn't feel right. And maybe you're like, how do you have a healthy questioning system, I guess, of yes, yeah. listen to your instincts, but also not to the point of being absurd? It, I mean, I wish there was some sort of method or best practices for that, because obviously, um, you know, the, the, 
sussing out something like uh, social or somatic dominance uh, is like a survival strategy that that we obviously need, mm. and especially people who are uh, marginalized uh, and and uh, disempowered by various social structures need. And you know, as a white cisgendered male, uh, I've had to learn that you know the the intuition that comes through hypervigilance through just the experience of having been harassed is not something that I've had to build up, and yet it's been essential for the survival of the people that I love. And so, yeah. um, so there's that. There's that. And then we are also bombarded with. Um, data streams that are just not intuitive. Like epidemiology is not intuitive. The way vaccines work is not bloody well intuitive. It's kind of miraculous. Like when you think about, oh, you know, they're going to put a little bit of denatured of this stuff in me to teach me how to go to war against it. But like nobody wants to line up and say, yeah, I want my flu shot or I want my COVID vaccine. Like that's yeah. not, it's not like, coming home to, to, to dinner or something like that. Um, it doesn't give anybody a warm feeling. Uh, mm. And so, and so I, and, and in the same way, and in the same way, the, 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 the information about political realities and uh, how, how, you know, complex systems work can't really be sussed out in intuitive ways. You need a lot of discipline. Speaking as a journalist, you need a lot of discipline to comb through and say, okay, well, can I verify that? That feels right, but can I be sure? And what am I biased towards? Or what do I want to see in this story? Uh, and yeah, it's like, it takes a lot of skill, but, you know, trusting what you feel with regard to what public health officials are telling you is just terrible terrible, terrible advice uh, yeah. because, because, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with, we're dealing with really complex systems that our bodies don't understand. I mean, that's, I mean, I, I, maybe that's a good, a good point to bring up with regard to this being a novel coronavirus. <laughs> like we don't actually, what would, what would we be intuitively aware of? This is not something yeah. that we've encountered before. And so, and so. It's such a good point. Like, right. Your intuition, yes, is there, but sometimes it, it goes against what you need to do. Um, Evan, my boyfriend, had a tumor in his chest, and yeah. um, it took us a long time to figure out what it was. And it's funny because he used to meditate, and he would be like, oh, I'm really feeling something in my heart chakra, and then he ended up having a tumor. But um, wow. it was actually That's, a physical can I sensation. Just say, can I just say, like, l l I th I'm really glad that, that that was discovered, and I'm hoping that, that the treatment was good. Well, yeah, I, well, yeah. The shit, next, I mean, that's an exact, that's a great example. That's a great example because, because you know, cancer is, the, 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 inside of the, the inside of the body is actually insensate for the most part. We can sort of tell what's happening, but we don't have a good read on it. It's a black yeah. box. And, and, yep. and that's, and if it wasn't a black box, we would be driven mad by internal sensation. Like exactly. interoception, interoception, the capacity to feel like how you're breathing or what you're swallowing or stuff like that, that has a hard limit to it. And if it didn't, we would be totally obsessed with every little like intestinal gurgle. And so, <laughs> and so, and so the thing about cancer is that it's not something that we discover until it's shown to us generally, or until it makes, it's large enough that it makes some sort of mechanical uh, obstruction mm -hmm. into our movement. And here's the thing, here's the thing is that the entire new age wellness uh, ideology is built upon the premise of absolute self-knowledge, right? And, yeah, so, yeah. and so when it encounters a situation in which actually you don't know what's going on in there, it's super, super insulted. It, yeah. it, there's a real, it presents a real attack on uh, the, 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 the grandiosity. And I would say the defensive narcissism that says, I know everything about myself and you, don't, you can't tell me anything and I'm perfectly in control. Yeah. Uh, and I think this comes up in the, in the anti-masking uh, stuff as well, because you know, when people 
people have all kinds of weird objections like oh it's it's you know symbolizes the suppression of my free speech or it's like oh sig signaling that i'm a slave or something like that or it's or or you know jp sears will say say you know it 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 removes the connection between us and we can't you know it's going to impact our brains negatively as though like you're not taking your mask off at home and talking with people on Skype and seeing their faces. It's like yeah. just bizarre. Anyway, um, yeah. I think one of the things that they don't say, because I think it's actually hard to articulate, is that when you tell a, a new age wellness aficionado that they might be sick, but asymptomatic, you're like giving them a, like a, a you're giving them a brain problem because yeah. There, because because what they have to believe uh, in order to fulfill their ideology is that they know exactly what's going on in their bodies at all times, which means being asymptomatically ill with COVID-19 is just not a thing. I would know if I was sick. So don't fucking tell me that I'm sick because, yeah. because I'm not. Like it's, it's an insult. And that's why I think the, 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 the mask is just such a bizarrely emotional idea because, because, the, because the folks are like personally insulted yeah. by the, the notion that, that they're not in total control and they're not omnisciently like savant about themselves. I mean, I'll tell you a really hard lesson is like when, when we did discover that tumor, we, we wanted to go the natural route and we did. Yeah. And we had naturopathic doctors telling Evan not to take steroids, not to get surgery, because if we heal the trauma from his childhood, it would dissolve the tumor. And, you know, we we're two late twenties guys living in Kelowna and we desperately wanted to believe that we could think ourselves into making it better. Like Evan wasn't happy enough. He didn't love himself enough, you know, and it was a really hard pill to swallow when we have to take you to emergency, you have to get surgery and you go on these pills you're rejecting, but then they end up saving your life. Wow. It's, it's a really, it fucks you up because it challenges your beliefs. But then now we know on the other side, yeah, wellness is a thing. Meditation is a thing. Eating, diet, all of those things are important, yeah. but if there's a tumor in your chest, you need to get it out. You need to take medicine. Can I also just say that, you know, um, uh, I'm really glad that, that Evan got good care. Um, but there's also, I would say like, a, um, I don't think it's vicarious, but I don't know what the term is, but a kind of displaced trauma that's laid on you as yeah. the partner, uh, because part of what the messaging is, is that if you can love him better or, 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 um, or help him love himself, or it's got to bring up all kinds of stuff around like, oh, oh well, crazy. Is, this relation, yeah. is this relationship healthy or am I, am I hurting him or am yeah, I like, it's helping him? Essentially, our books told us that it was our fault. You know, if you get sick, it's because of something you were thinking or feeling yeah. that, and it's that, that's hard. And so when I see these anti-maskers saying, you know, uh, you know, you don't need medicine. You don't need Western medicine. I'm like, have you been sick? Have you been critically ill before right. in your life? Because if right. you have, chances are you know sometimes you need medicine. Right, you right. Know? You crazy. know, and it's always, and it's just a, a little history. You're, you, you might, you might be aware of this, but I always go back to like the roots of this in the nineteen late 1970s and early 1980s is is uh, the, the, the bullshit trip that was placed on gay men with regard to AIDS yeah. by people like yeah. Louise Hay, right? Oh, I know. Who, you right? Love so, so you're, you're, you're you know, like you, if, if, g gay men bore the brunt of this terrible, like, um, insinuation that uh, you didn't, you, you know, you didn't, y'all you, you didn't love each other, you love yourselves enough. And so obviously your, your, your immune systems were going to like become dysfunctional or something like that. And yeah. what a terrible, awful, punitive, homophobic thing to do. And, and I don't think people are aware enough that, um, you know, everybody who basically has a book on the shelf in the new age wellness section in the bookstore at one point was probably inspired by, uh, if not mentored by Louise Hay. And so yeah. it's like, there's some really dirty stuff uh, going back in the history of it. And I think it's like, uh, I mean, what I'm happy about is that it's becoming more and more predictable, but I think like the, the, the impact upon relationships is just so, so, so tragic because it is. 
Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm, and not knowing anything about your relationship, you probably have, you know, you just like everybody else, you probably have issues and problems, but to lay, yeah. you know, somebody's, somebody's mortal, uh, uh, you know, chances uh, on, on the relational and the psycho psychological, yeah, it was just so unfair. It ended up being a huge blessing because we, we did, Evan is doing great now. He's totally healthy. Um, but it, it was a huge opportunity for us to evaluate, you know, what, what are we doing here? And at what point do your beliefs start taking you to dark places? Um, and it was great. And I actually remember reading a return to love by Marianne Williamson in that chapter where she says, you know, they were getting, um, gay men to write letters to their HIV diagnosis and, and, you know, finding a way to love it because if you loved it, it would go away. Something about that. And I was on an airplane and remember thinking, this is interesting. I don't really know how I feel about it, but um, it, to be per perfectly honest, it didn't register as homophobic in the moment, but in the broader picture where, you know, people are dying and you're turning it back on them to fix it. It's, and because it was AIDS, then, you know, it's such a... Well, that's the thing is that, is that, you know, maybe homophobic is a little bit of a stretch and that, and that actually what's more involved is a kind of opportunism, which is that mm. the, the new age wellness person sees an issue. It's impacting marginalized people that, sh that she can like make inroads with or gain social capital with. And then she says some shit about it that seems to be resonant with a bunch of people. But, but, and it's, but it's because it impacts gay men uh, that it ends up being structurally homophobic because instead yeah, of yeah. putting attention on, well, let's fucking change the social determinants of help or, or let's put more money into, into, into research and vaccination issue uh, uh, platforms instead of like, you know, uh, self psychology stuff. Uh, it's, it's about displacement of attention as well. Right. Because, yeah, totally. because if you, if you spend a lot of, you're not a medical doctor, you know, you haven't gone to like theological seminary. So even in terms of your own religious, you know, credibility, you're kind of out on a limb. And then you go and you tell uh, gay men, this is how you should love yourself to cure your disease. Like, what the fuck are you speaking from? And how much time yeah. and money are you wasting in terms of people's attention that could be placed on different, you know, on, on real solutions? I was thinking, I was listening to that um, interview with two of the guys who... I don't know what the organization was called. It might've been ACT UP or the Breakaway organization who they were talking about how, um, you know, getting to know and work with and, and doing battle with Tony Fauci over the years. Um, but they were talking about how, you know, back in the eighties, there was no access to uh, information and, and they like went from being artists in the East village or something like that to studying biochemistry textbooks on their own wow. in, reading, in reading circles so that they could understand what they, need, what they needed to ask the CDC to do. And it's like, wow, you know, they could have, instead of, you know, they could have, instead of like having reading circles with biochemistry textbooks, they could have gotten suckered into reading a course in miracles instead and then where would they oh be? my god so you true. know what i'm oh saying like it's, it's a good it's, point yeah it's not yeah. just that it's not just that the bad ideas are bad ideas it's that they steal time from people yeah it's, they, they do they distract people from what's what's what would be workable what would be like you know it's very it would be it would have been very easy for those men to have just been suckered into a course of miracles and then they would like be reciting lesson 136 the rest of their lives sickness is a defense against the truth uh right, and exactly like, yeah and then they would die and then that would be it and and but it would be their it's... fault and then blah, and it blah, would be there yeah, it would be it would yeah it would be their fault it would be their fault and there would also be this like creepy like you know, halo around their memory. Oh, well, they died with such acceptance, you know? Oh, God. No, Which is you. so gross. It's just gross. Yeah. Um, so now I, I'm curious about if spirituality and spiritual experiences are subjective or if there is a way to actually define them. Because I have found so much inspiration from, let's say, pop culture, celebrity. Yeah, right. yeah the belief that I can, anything is possible. And that belief opened me up and in turn like really rounded out my spirituality. It made me meditate. It made me be sober. It, it really grounded me, even though it's so crazy, it gave me a sense of reality. And the podcast that I started was an exploration of how pop culture affects spirituality. Oh, and wow, yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm it's so having, great. It's such a great yeah. topic. I got, I got, I got to listen. I got to listen to a bunch of it now. Yeah. But it's like, okay. So, is there something objective about spiritual experiences? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, going right back to William James, uh, the, the the definition of religion is kind of like the peak experiences surrounding the deepest issues of our lives. Is that's always resonant, and you know, if that comes from being completely overwhelmed by the brilliance of Kylie Minogue and whatever yeah, or yeah. something or or like or 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 I don't know watching Paris is burning or watching exactly uh, Edith, yeah. Edith Piaf or or like who whoever the whoever the icon is and seeing that somehow they were able to create such incredible beauty whilst being so strange and odd and and fucked up in a way and they just didn't care and they just went for it like that's yeah that's that's what what wouldn't be what wouldn't be spiritually compelling about that you know exactly um, and i think like it being uh like a conduit something that sparks totally. something in you that makes you go down that path and it could be the thing that i find interesting it could be an obsession with fame that makes you go and explore or it could be the pope and you go to go and see <laughs> right. him you know like right. how can two things that are so different invigorate the spirit in the same way that to me is so interesting and is it true like are is that spiritual experience real it feels real or is it more of a disillusionment with a fantasy? You know, because you well, can say the same thing about re um, religion too, that you can about fame obsession. Right. I mean, I, I think, I think like where my brain is going to is that there's a, there's a, there's a feeling sense, a peak experience feeling sense in the, the, the scenarios that you bring up in a comparative sense. And like, it does seem that, that that can come from anywhere and anything. And then there are, I, I would say two other considerations involved, like A, um, is it, is that experience generated from something and, and does it remain within a context of the pro-social or the ethical? Uh, so that would be one right. consideration. And then, and then, uh, you know, yeah, I'm because I'm sure that that Jim Watkins, as he is like running eight coon and QAnon, is having some moments of peak experience. Exactly, manipulating exactly. people. Sociopaths, yeah. sociopaths have ecstasy, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so, um, so there's, so there's, you know, is is the peak experience? Is it approachable through through interdependence and ethics? And then the other thing is like. How intense do you need it to be over the length of your lifetime? Because, um, and can you, uh, for me, uh, this would be my goal is, is can, I, uh, can I find peak experiences and pleasures in smaller and smaller moments and in more normal and normal things? Yes. Uh, so that so that I don't have to, and I think this might resonate with anybody who's had to become sober or anybody who has like, um, you know, uh, just had to, to, to reduce and recycle a little bit. Um, for me, it happens also because, you know, we've got two little boys at home and like, there's just never, there's hardly any time to yeah. do you know, fun things for yourself. So, so it's really a matter of like, um, okay, well, how I've got, I've got like maybe 30 seconds here in the kitchen where I can stand and appreciate this glass or this mug or something like that. And yeah, and so, so those, those are the, those like the, 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 the feeling of this peak experience that I, I think is very common and that people seem to resonate with. Um, that's like, it, maybe maybe it's a universal thing. I don't know, but but the, those two qualifying frames are you know does it hurt other people <laughs> uh, and uh, or yourself and, or yourself and uh, is it sustainable in the sense that it doesn't depend on like uh, a, a, an ongoing escalation of stimulus in order mm. to in order to be in order to be helpful you know yeah that's a great lens like if you can 
if you can have a spiritual experience, but then like not need that thing replicated over and over and over again. And it yeah. sort of offers insight. And then it's funny you bring up the glass of water because I was talking to a friend yesterday about how, you know, what can, can anything be spiritual? And I said, well, what if you have a really busy life and the only time you have to quiet your mind and be mindful is when you're brushing your teeth in your morning. Does brushing right. your teeth become a spiritual experience? Right, you know? right, right. Yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I, I loved our conversation. I can't believe it's already been an hour, but yeah, yeah. I'd love to have you back at some point. I can't wait to tell everybody I know about your podcast. It's such an important conversation. And I was really excited to talk to you about my own, like the pop culture spin and you gave some really good insights. So thank you so much. Yeah. Well, you're welcome, Peter. It's a pleasure to speak with you and uh, we're, we're neighbors. So maybe we'll actually run into each other at some point. Yes. I, I'd All love right. to. What part of the city are you in? Uh, in the beaches. Awesome. Oh my God. I love the beaches. We're in Liberty yeah. Village. So next time oh, I'm good. down there, I'll let you know. Okay, good. Okay. Take care. Thanks for talking. Talk to you soon, Matthew. Bye-bye. Right, take care.